Let's take our Bibles or iPads or whatever you have the Scriptures on and turn to the book of Acts. This morning, chapter 16. It's been a marvelous, marvelous morning. Did you see the children streaming out just a moment ago? What a sight that is. In the first hour, uh, a little three-year-old boy came up to me before the service, and he's tugging on my, on my pant leg, and uh, he had a question for me. So I bent over, and uh, I said, what's your question? He said, is God omnipresent? <laughs> I didn't know that word till I was in college. He's three years of age. I said, yes, he's everywhere. He said, is he omnipotent? I said, absolutely. And I thought for a minute he'd wandered into one of my sermons or my doctrinal uh, uh, studies on Sunday nights, but no, his dad said, it's the children's ministry at First Baptist Church. That's where he's learning all of this. So it's a good place to be. I, I don't know if you notice it. I hope you do, that what we're about at First Baptist is building a community of faith really a family of God's people. And that's for you, whether you grew up in Alexandria, grew up in this church, or more likely if you are a transplant to our city. You've come here from somewhere else. We want this to feel like home for you because that's what we are. We're a family. We sing together. We rejoice together at God's goodness. We welcome babies. We mourn the saints who've gone on. We're a family. Now, amazingly, there are people all around us who don't think they'd fit into this. I think everybody should feel like they're welcome and would fit in, but amazingly, a lot of folks don't think they do. Uh, they think we're all of a certain type, maybe rather affluent or middle class anyway, and uh, educated, and uh, our lives are all together. We've worked it all out. Religion adds to our lives, but we're pretty good people anyway. And they look at that and they think, I could never fit in. Some come on Sundays, maybe you today, and you're here to kind of check us out, to see if you might fit in. And, and some walk away week by week thinking, no, they don't. Others uh, never even get in the door. They drive by and make that assumption. Well, if that's you this morning, I want to disabuse you of that right away. We are not all the same. We are very different individuals. And it's amazing what God has done to bring us all together. Different people, different walks of life, but we found something in Jesus and in this church that gives great meaning to our lives. Acts chapter 16, beginning at verse 11 and following. You remember last week, Paul wanted to go into, further into Asia, but the Holy Spirit wouldn't let him, sent him rather through a vision over into Macedonia. And the, the first real stop there was Philippi. And while he's there, Paul and Silas, they have encounters with three different individuals, different as night and day, could not be more dissimilar, but each one comes to know Christ. And they form that new church at Philippi. And as we look at this this morning, you may find yourself in one of these characters. Okay, chapter 16, verse 11 and following. And the first person we're going to meet is a very successful, perhaps wealthy businesswoman named Lydia. Chapter 16, verse 11. From Troas we put out to sea and sail straight for Samothrace. And the next day, on to Neapolis, or the new city. From there, we traveled to Philippi, a Roman colony and the leading city of that district of Macedonia. And we stayed there several days. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. Now, this is different for Paul. This is not his usual strategy. You remember what he would normally do on the Sabbath is he would go to the synagogue. He'd find a congregation of people who already believed in God, and that's where he'd start. Evidently, at Philippi, there wasn't a synagogue. So he hears about a prayer meeting down by the river, and that's where he goes. To have a synagogue, you needed at least 10 Jewish men. So in Philippi, there weren't that many. So he goes down by the river to pray. He goes down there because he's heard of a prayer meeting. We sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. Again, there are no men. Women. And women, let's face it, 
usually are more attuned to God than men. I don't think that's so true at First Baptist. You saw the, the men we have here and so many others in our congregation. But in a lot of places, it's, it's the women who are seeking after God. And that's what was going on in Philippi. These women are down there praying. One of those listening was a woman named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth from the city of Thyatira, who was a worshiper of God. Lydia is from Thyatira. That was a city that was known, famous for its purple dye. And she's the salesperson for that. She's got the franchise. And so in Philippi, she has become quite wealthy. And the scripture says she's a God-fearer, and she's praying. Now that's interesting to me. Think about it a moment. She's a, a wealthy woman, powerful woman, a leader in her community. She's a God-fearer. She already believes in God, and she already believes in prayer. She is praying on the Sabbath day. What else does she need? Does she need anything other than that? I mean, if you already believe in God, and you're already praying, you've got your religion, you've got your ritual, do you need anything else? Sometimes people say, why do you Christians insist on talking to people about Jesus when they've already got a religion that satisfies them? Well, leave them alone. Well, Paul didn't feel that way. He goes down there and he strikes up a conversation, begins to share, and, and the next verse says, look at it, and the Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. I love that. The Lord opened her heart. I pray that happens every Sunday. I pray that would happen today, that as I'm talking, the Lord would open your heart. Yes, she believed in God. Yes, she had a ritual. Yes, she prayed, but there was something missing. I don't know that she knew it until this day. But she quickly realized that though she had a religion, there was an emptiness deep in her soul. And when Paul began to talk about Jesus, things began to click. It made sense. And she wanted to know him. There's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved other than the name of Jesus. And God opened her heart and she believed. When she and the members of her household were baptized, and that's the first thing you do after you put your faith in Christ, when she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, Come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. It's like uh, Paul needed a lot of urging. He was glad. She persuaded us, and there we went. What I see in that paragraph is that the first thing that happens once you become a believer is you get baptized. And one of the first evidences that it's genuine, that it's real, is that you open up your life to other people. You open up your home. That's what she does. The first thing, Paul, if you, if you consider me a true believer, I want you to come to my house, have a meal with me, stay in my house. And by the end of the chapter, she's invited the whole church to come in. She has church in her living room. The gift of hospitality. When your life has changed, you suddenly have a concern for other people and you want to share that with others either into your home or around your table. Wouldn't it be wonderful on Sundays when every guest that comes into this place looking to see if it's genuine, if it's real, if every one of them was invited out either to a restaurant with you or to your home to share a meal. Now, here's what's working against us. We live in the D.C. area. And around here, it's more of a let's circle the wagons mentality, you know, or my home is my castle. I work all week out there, and when I finally get a weekend, I finally get some time, I want to just hunker down. I don't want to talk to anybody I don't have to talk to. You could say, well, that's my personality. I don't, I don't have that outgoing sort of person. Well, you can change. God can change your heart. If you can't invite them into your home or your apartment, take them out for a meal and share. John Chrysostom, the 4th century bishop of Constantinople, uh, now uh, Istanbul, he encouraged every Christian family to have a Christ room in their house. A Christ room, a place where they could show Christian 
hospitality. I was talking to Audrey about it. She said, our Christ room is our dining room around our table where we can have people over and we can, we can share Christ's love with them. I like that idea. Lydia is a successful businesswoman. She's a leader. Now she's a Christian, and she's still a leader. At First Baptist, we celebrate the gifts and talents of men and women. She's a leader who found her way into the church. But look at the next story. I want you to meet somebody else. Chapter 16, verse, verse uh, 10, or verse 16. Once we were going to the place of prayer, and we were met by a slave girl. Now, that's the opposite end of the spectrum, isn't it? A slave girl who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her masters by fortune-telling. Now, she's a slave. She's a demonized. She has some sort of spirit. Whether she could really tell the future or not, we're not sure, but that's how she was marketed Probably she sold other things as well. She worked for these businessmen. They were making money off. We're talking about human trafficking. That's what's going on here. Well, this girl followed Paul and the rest of us, shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so troubled that he turned around and said to the Spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. And at that moment, the spirit left her. When the owners of the slave girl realized that their hope of making money was gone, you see, the spirit was gone, the demon was gone, now the money's gone. When they realized their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, these men are Jews. And what that has to do with it, I don't know. Sounds a little anti-Semitic to me. These men are Jews, and they're throwing our city into an uproar. Well, not the whole city, just these merchants. Throwing the whole city in an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or to practice. Highly emotional. They're agitating the people, and they're anti-Semitic and prejudiced too. And so they bring them before the authorities, and Paul and Silas end up in jail. But look at that girl. She has nothing to commend her. She's not acceptable to anybody. She's a piece of property. But Paul sees more in her than that. Now, she's telling fortunes. She sets up a little table there in the piazza, and she's uh, putting down tarot cards, or she's got a Ouija board, or she's looking at your palm, and she's telling your future, and people buy into that. Let me just say right now, Christian, you don't have any business doing any of that stuff. You don't need to participate in that. You don't need to read your horoscope every day. You don't need to have your palm read. Even for fun, there's no purpose in it. If you want to pay somebody to tell you your fortune, your future, then pay me and I'll tell you. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow you all the days of your life, and you will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. There it is. That's your future. If you're a Christian, you don't need to pay people money for that. Well, she's making her profits for, she didn't get any of it. She was making money for these merchants. And she's walking around behind Paul and Silas, screaming at the top of her lungs, These are the servants of the Most High God who are showing you the way of salvation. And she does it for quite a while, and Paul finally turns around and speaking to the spirit, not to the girl, but to the spirit in the girl, commands that spirit to come out. Now, again, this is something interesting. Isn't that the message that you'd want? It, that's free publicity. She's walking around before you and behind you. Listen to these men. They're giving you the way of salvation. It's not that Paul is annoyed by it. It's that Paul doesn't want any connection in anybody's mind between the truth of the gospel and the occult. That's why I said what I said to you a moment ago. There is no relation. The gospel doesn't need that. And so he was silencing the demon. Some scholars say there's a little bit more to it than that. 
Actually, what she was saying was, the, the article's a little different, these men are showing you a way of salvation. Not the way, a way. And if that's indeed what she's saying, then that's totally wrong. Because there are not many ways. There is but one way through Jesus. Well, she's saved. And she's set free. And she joins the church. Now, that changes the complexion of everything, doesn't it? you got Lydia over here, and right beside her on the pew... You've got this slave girl who's now been set free. I want you to meet one more person down in uh, verse 22. And this is a lowly government apparatchik, just a bureaucrat, just goes to work like maybe you do every day serving the government. He is a jailer in the prison. Verse 22. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten. After they'd been severely flogged, just like Jesus was, you remember? Severely flogged. They were thrown into the prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. That didn't even need to be said, because it was the law. If you were a jailer and your prisoner escaped, then his sentence became yours, and that would be the death penalty. The jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. Upon receiving such orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. He's in the dungeon. These guys are in the dungeon now, where there's no air, there's no light, there's no sanitation. The darkest, dampest part of the jail. And that's where they are. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. It's midnight, and they're singing and they're praising God. Now, you were doing that a minute ago and, and doing it quite well, singing and praying and praising God. But it's Sunday morning, a beautiful Sunday morning in autumn, and this is a lovely place, and you're with your friends Sure, we did it, but it's midnight in a dark dungeon for these guys, and they're doing it, praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Are you aware that people listen to you? They listen to your conversation? And not just the government either. I'm, I'm talking about the people who work in the next cubicle beside you, or, or the people who are at the table next to yours, the booth next to yours in the restaurant, and they're listening. They don't mean to, but, but they can hear things that you're saying. And when you're going through a difficult time in your life, that's when ears really perk up. People are really listening then. What's on your heart? What's on your mind? Are you afraid? These are the things they want to know. And so the prisoners are listening to Paul and Silas singing and praising God. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open, and everybody's chains came loose. Prison doors open. That's a recurring theme in Acts. You saw it in chapter 12. You saw it back in chapter 5. The disciples in jail, and the prison doors open. Now, now why is that such a theme in this book? I mean, it really happened that Luke is telling the story, but I think he highlights, he underlines this for us because it's true in the 21st century that sometimes we get behind prison doors. We get locked in to our past or to a habit we can't break or to some sort of persecution in our lives, and we feel bound. And Luke, writing Acts, wants us to know that prison doors can suddenly come open by the power of God. And so this earthquake just loosens all the doors. The jailer woke up when he saw the prison doors were opened, and he drew out his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had all escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. We are, all of us, still here. I don't know why the all other prisoners stayed put. I know why Paul and Silas did. Maybe the others are just so 
dumbfounded. They don't know to move. They, they just stand there. What's going to happen next? They're all here. We are here. Do yourself no harm. The jailer called for lights, rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? I don't know if he'd ever thought about that question before this moment. He just was doing his job day by day, a common government worker, getting up every day, getting on the metro, going into town, doing his job and coming home. I don't know that he ever thought about that question, but he almost committed suicide five seconds ago. He came that close to eternity, and I think he's shaking and quaking in his boots. What must I do to be saved? Have you ever asked that question? What, what must I do to have eternal life? Look at the answer that Paul gives him. They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. The word believe means to trust. It means to put your total confidence in Him. You turn away from your sin and you turn full face toward Jesus. And you believe what the Bible says about him, that he died for you, was buried, and rose again, and has a plan for your life. And you surrender to him as Savior and as Lord. That's what the word believe means. And Paul and Silas said, believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. And then the next line, you and your household. Now, it's not automatic. Every member of that household would have to make their own choice, too. But they'll follow daddy, they'll follow the husband, they'll follow the head of the family. It is very likely they will believe if you believe. And so the man believed. He bowed his head right there and gave his life to Christ. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all of his family were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. There's hospitality again. It's the first thing he does. Brings them into his house and sets a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole family. Now those three, now he's in the church. Next Sunday he's got his whole family. They fill up a pew. And they're, they're next to them or behind them is that, that servant girl, slave girl. Recently freed, now nobody knows what to do with her. But the church receives her, and there's Lydia. And she's dressed, you know, so immaculate. She's so dainty and beautiful, but her heart has changed. Now, these, these people are all different, but there's a common thread in there. Every one of them comes to faith in Christ. Every one of them gets baptized and joins the church because of the ministry of Paul and Silas. They share their faith. They speak the gospel. And these three believe. And their friends behind them believe. Their family members come too. They believe. It's somebody giving a witness. Everybody's uh, talking now about Ebola. And I'm, I'm not going to panic. I, I take the CDC at their word, and they, they remind us it's not airborne, and you've got, to, you've got to come into direct contact with bodily fluids. There's, there's got to be that touch and all of that. So we, we ought to pray but not, not panic. But when I hear all about that, I think about Christianity. You know, it's kind of like a virus, too, that spreads rapidly all around the world. You see it in the book of Acts. First, there there were 12 disciples, and they dropped down to 11. They added another. And then uh, very quickly, 120 were gathered in an upper room. Before that day of Pentecost was over, thousands have joined the church. And then the gospel so encircles the place that later in the book of Acts, it will be said they've turned the world upside down with this gospel. And still in the 21st century, it's the same. Wherever it goes, it takes root, and it changes lives. But again... In every instance, it is human contact. It's not angels out there preaching the gospel. It's not angels out there witnessing and sharing their faith. It's you and it's me 
And it's got to be personal contact. We've, we've got we've to get into people's lives and be willing to touch them and have them touch us. Too often what we do, we do what the, the CDC is recommending with Ebola. They, they found out those who've been in contact and they, they isolate them. They quarantine them lest they spread it to anybody else. And that makes good sense. But that's what we've done with the gospel. We who know Christ, we who've experienced Him, we quarantine ourselves inside the church. So nobody out there can catch it. You and I who know Christ need to go with joy in good times and bad, good circumstances or the worst night of our lives and still share that story, that old, old story of Jesus and His love. I want us to pray now. Would you bow with me for a moment? We're going to sing and I'm going to stand here at the front of the room as I do every week. And if you would give your heart to Christ today, you've never asked Him into your life, but you'd be willing to do it today. I want you to come. If you've received Christ privately, but you've never let anybody know, you ought to come today and say, I am a believer and I want to be baptized. That's always the progression. You believe and then you're baptized and we'll do that for you in the near future. Or maybe you're a believer and you live in our city now and you need to be a part of a church like this. We invite you to come and join with us. Father, speak to every heart in life now and give people courage to respond, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together and we sing.